from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this first weekend of May. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. A nuclear farm? And a lot of people come to my house all the time and pull up and say, I hate to bother you. I said, you're here for the bomb, right? That's American countryside. There is nothing that we found that overnight we can fix poor soil. Small changes that could pay off in big ways. We explore how to flip your soil. You couldn't see, like somebody put a brown blanket in front of your windshield. Couldn't see nothing. We're looking into what caused the rare and fatal Illinois dust storm this week. And in John's world. Dust, tillage, and technology. Now for the news, the latest crop progress report shows that planting is moving ahead at a record pace in some states. And that's especially the case when it comes to soybeans. USDA reporting right now 26% of the corn crop is planted. That is right on par with the five-year average nationally. Check out Missouri. 80% of the corn crop is in the ground, almost double the average pace. While in North Dakota, nothing is planted yet and just 1% is planted in South Dakota. Meanwhile, 19% of the soybean crop is in the ground nationwide, eight percentage points ahead of average. Arkansas, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia are all at or near record pace when it comes to soybeans. The Federal Reserve Board this week announcing it's raising interest rates again, hiking them a quarter point. It's the 10th rate increase since the central bank started its battle against inflation last March. The announcement coming just days after the collapse of First Republic Bank, the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history. That's prompting concerns from some economists that the Fed is moving too aggressively in its ongoing effort to fight inflation. Raising interest rates allows the Fed to intentionally slow parts of the economy by making it more expensive for banks to borrow money. Now that cost then gets passed on to the consumer. But the Fed also signaled that it may now pause its streak of rate hikes. A rare dust storm in Illinois turned deadly on Monday, causing a massive pileup on a major highway in the central part of the state. Dozens more were injured. Police say more than 70 vehicles crashed on a two-mile stretch of Interstate 55. It happened as 45 to 55 mile per hour winds swept through nearby farms and fields, picking up dirt, soil, and other debris, blinding drivers. Could the conditions that caused the storm been avoidable? We're actually taking a deeper dive into the accident and the issues surrounding it coming up in the next half hour. No dust storms for most of California anytime soon, as the latest snowpack survey shows. State officials are reporting a snow water equivalent of 49.2 inches, or 254% of average for the start of May. At one station, they recorded a snow water equivalent of 241%. And as you can see how that compares to past years, a major difference from last year, thanks to a series of atmospheric rivers that hit the state starting in December. That system also causing flooding across the state. The last time we were here was in May of 2020 when we only measured about an inch and a half of snow water content. So a major difference to what we're seeing here today when we're standing on almost five feet worth of snow depth and almost 30 in about 30 inches of snow water content. Officials say the massive snowpack will continue to pose continued flood risks in the San Joaquin Valley. The latest ag economy barometer shows farmer sentiments is improving going into planting season. The April survey from Purdue University and the CME group coming in at a reading of 123. That's up six points from the previous month and a reverse of a two month decline. It's thanks to an increase in the current conditions index and the index of future expectations. When asked to look ahead one year, more producers said they expect to be better off financially than now, with fewer respondents expecting conditions to worsen compared to both a month earlier and one year earlier. A shakeup in the seed business. Bayer announcing that it's moving all of its regional brands under channel. In total, 10 brands, as you can see on your screen, will start to change over starting next year. Bayer's Crop Science Division saying it will combine the best elements of its regional and channel brands to provide an improved experience for customers. The company is saying it will allow customers to receive the local agronomic support that they have come to know and trust. Bayer adding existing regional brand products will continue to be available through the 2024 growing season before shifting to a portfolio of channel products in 2025. 
Leaders say while this change will affect some brands and people, the vast majority of the business will not be impacted. There's a new face for the Got Milk campaign. Here at Wood Milk Orchards, we're certain that our artisanal wood milk will be the only milk you'll want to drink for the rest of your life. It's actress Aubrey Plaza mocking plant-based milk alternatives with the fake brand in the ad called Wood Milk. The White Lotus star even saying she's the co-founder of the so-called Wood Milk. The ad has its own website where you can even get the t-shirt. There's also the disclaimer, is Wood Milk real? And the answer is no, only real milk is real, but the Got Milk campaign is pledging to plant 10,000 trees in partnership with One Tree Planet. That's it for the news. Well, it was a cold start to May for some areas, but parts of the plains once again seeing some rain and some warmer weather may be on the way for other areas. We'll have a check of your forecasts next. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The 8200 series wide body forage boxes are available in 18 to 30 foot models. They feature a new dual gate delay system and a patented center drive system. Learn more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. Matt, finally some good news for planting. Warmer weather is on the way. I hope you're doing well, Ty. Yeah, you look at uh, the forecast next week, and uh, a ridge of high pressure is going to dominate a good portion of the United States. Two thirds of the United States looking at above normal, above average temperatures uh, through our Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, where it is warm, it's also going to be cold, below normal temperatures back here on the West Coast. So what we're setting up is a trough that's going to dig back down here to the south and work across the United States. So the above normal conditions will last most of the week and then this pattern will start to break down. But right now it does look like uh, we're going to see two thirds of the United States uh, well above average uh, through most of next week. Uh, the root zone, uh, checking out uh, what's going on with the, uh, the wet or the dry. I uh, got to the blue up into Wisconsin. Uh, it's been pretty wet through those locations, but check out, we're starting to hint at another drought uh, setting up across the plains, uh, the deep or the bright red uh, indicating just that. Uh, now there's not a lot of relief on the way. Uh, what goes with those above average high temperatures uh, comes with a very quiet pattern across those areas. But as that trough digs, now from the west to the east, as you'll see in a second, that is going to pick up some moisture. Unfortunately, it's not one of those uh, soaker type situations where we'll see a couple of days of rain. Uh, expect dry conditions and warm conditions through the plains next week. And this is May 9th through the 13th, about average through the Midwest and then a little bit drier where we place that trough with a ridge out here on the West Coast. Let's go ahead and dig into a little bit more regarding that jet stream. The lines uh, that scoot to the north, that's going to be your ridge under there. That's where you got dry weather. You also have clear skies and warm temperatures uh, where the lines dig to the south. That's our trough, and this is a pretty typical pattern, especially in spring. Uh, the ridge is going to be moving or breaking down late in the work week and into uh, next weekend, uh, which is where we start to pick up some of those rain chances. So there's the trough. A cooler than average conditions underneath the trough with a chance of some moisture developing back out here to the west. The best chance of rain, though, is going to be right along this dividing line into the four corners. Again, that's on Wednesday. As we progress this into Thursday and Friday of next week, the ridge gets smaller, a little squished. Above average highs still stick around most of the Midwest back down into the southeast. But the rain and the cooler air starts to take shape back out here to the west. And that takes you all the way through Friday and one of the reasons why we have those above average conditions. Quick check in the next 10 days regarding the precipitation forecast at Texas so looking like quite the soaker in regards to rainfall. Thanks Matt. Well more planting delays in the north but a record planting pace for other states. We have Alan Brugler and John Payne with us this weekend. Our marketing discussion happens next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Alan Brugler and John Payne joining us. Alan, you know, talking a lot about the spring planting pace, impressive in some areas, not so impressive in others. Looks like we are going to get warmer weather here. Is the market focused at all on the U.S. planting pace? I think the market's fairly comfortable with the planting pace right now. We're, we've seen very rapid progress across Missouri, southern Illinois, Indiana. You're starting to get uh, some improved weather for areas a little further north. And still, yeah, we're, we're a little concerned about the, the northern plains in, in Minnesota. 
but I think we, we've kind of gotten used to the idea that uh, USDA will have to cut the planted acreage, that we're going to see a little bit of prevent plant there. Uh, unfortunately, that seems to already be built into the price. And uh, we're, because we're comfortable with both the Brazilian crop right now and the U.S. planting progress, the price has been under a little bit of pressure here. John, you know, an area actually seen rain that needed it. If you look at Lubbock, Texas, that area of West Texas, the Texas Panhandle. Do you think that that actually aids a shift in planting and we could see more cotton acres this year? Well, I, I don't think so. I think the intentions are probably set. You know, if guys are going to chase off Milo here, Milo would be a good one to plant anyway, just given its non-GMO exposure. So I don't think you're going to see a major change. Uh, maybe like Alan said, a little bit lower on prevent planting corn. You know, switching to soybeans, when you look at demand, Alan, there are some concerns about new crop demand for soybeans. How bad is it at this point? Well, the forward sales on soybeans are, are very poor. Uh, of course, we just had export sales uh, reported this week again. The uh, book forward bookings for next year, the third lowest uh, on our books. Uh, the only two years that were lower were uh, 19 and 20. Of course, the one was the trade war with China and the other one was COVID. So, yeah, that's a pretty pretty uh, low endorsement for, for bullishness in beans. I think part of that's the, just the whole short crop, long tail thing. We were at 10-year highs last year. Uh, the, the market's expecting prices to revert back towards the mean, that, that over time things will get cheaper. Uh, very comfortable with that record crop that Brazil had this past season. And uh, so... Yeah, we're 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 kind of grinding lower here and and not wanting to commit too much. So that that's not not encouraging. Uh, you, you have the bull story on the on the renewable diesel side, but those plants still have to be built in many cases. Uh, I can be more bullish on bean oil than I can on beans right now. John, you guys have some offices down in Brazil. I mean, is all of that new crop demand is it truly moving to South America? Well, I think the biggest issue that Brazil has is that the pace of growth. In, as far as export, I'm sorry, as uh, acreage expansion hasn't been met by infrastructure. So, you know, you've essentially doubled production over the last 10 years, we'll call it. And the amount of roads and the amount of transportation access and the amount of, you know, just offloading vehicles that are available aren't double. So you have supply now off a really good crop year. And Alan mentioned the year prior, another good crop year. You have, um, you know, a market that I think certainly has just nowhere to go on these sales. So I could be real bearish on that aspect. Obviously, supply exists, but if you want to be bullish, you can spin it to say, hey, the beans that are stuck in Mato Grasso right now, those aren't competitive with the U.S. port anyway. They're not getting out. So if you need beans in the short run, I mean, you're going to turn to Brazil, but if you need excess amount of what's planned, you're going to need to go to the U.S. because the line's going to be really long just to get it out of uh, ports like Paranagua. Alan, when you look at wheat, I mean, we're going to get, you know, a better picture of the wheat crop as we see some of these wheat tours take a place. But, you know, really, what had a stronghold on wheat prices this week? Well, of course, wheat takes no prisoners. And we were we were grinding lower. The funds had a huge short position in Chicago. And uh, we're, we're keeping their thumb on it pretty, pretty, pretty heavy into the beginning of the week. Well, what kind of turned us around was we had a, a very large export sale to to Egypt, 655,000 tons. It wasn't U.S. wheat, but it was demand. And then, of course, the crop condition ratings have been expected to improve this week after those rains in, in the Southern Plains. They really didn't budge. Uh, so the, the ratings are still poor. HRW's uh, supply was already down from last year's crop problems and is not going to rebound as much. Well, from the decision by the Fed this week to another bank failure, what are we watching with that when it comes to the market? We'll talk to John Payne and Alan Brugler coming up. The Illinois dust storm that we told you about in news, that was about 125 miles west of John's farm. The incident sparked calls for change and even mandatory conservation practices. But is that even realistic? Here's John Phipps. Last Monday, high winds and dust proved to be a deadly combination for unfortunate motorists on I-55 about 100 miles west of my farm. Proponents of no-till and cover crops rightly pointed out that if those practices were more common, this tragedy might have been averted. More crucially, traffic visibility hazards could increase 
Average wind speeds are increasing globally, likely due to climate changes. This may not have been noted except for the growth of the wind energy industry where vastly more data is now available. Regardless, the tillage trend is and has been for years in places like this away from no-till and toward tillage. Cover crops were used on about 40% of cropland in 2021, according to one report, but that was only among farmers who used any conservation practice. The percentage for all farmers was not revealed, and it was doubtless lower. Nonetheless, I doubt tillage trends will reverse for solid reasons. First and most importantly, no-till and cover crops are totally dependent on chemicals. No-till was barely known until glyphosate, for example. Consequently, while weeds continue to find ways to outwit herbicides, none have proven resistant to steel. Second, as outlined recently in Farm Journal, long-term no-till stratifies nutrients into the top inch of the soil. Roots need food farther down. Third, the economics of tillage choices is a moving target affected by yield difference, which is an argument I will not get into, and input cost. Right now, a $9 trip with a 30-year-old finisher beats a $50 herbicide application on our farm. Finally, barring rigorous enforced regulations, such as loss of crop insurance su subsidies, there are few ways to make farmers change their ways, even to overwhelmingly more beneficial environmental practices. The other stick that could be used is litigation against farmers when harm comes to others, like this sad event. Liability insurance premiums could soon reflect such hazards. Oddly, there is a practical solution to reduce traffic accidents caused by weather and visibility conditions, autonomous or at least guidance-enhanced vehicles. That technology kept me where I should be this dusty spring when working occasionally blind in the field. Improvements in sensors, sensors like LIDAR and GPS location accuracy eventually will make unfortunate occurrences rare as our vehicle fleet gradually adds these features. Now that'll take a decade or two, but that's probably faster than getting agreement by farmers on how to farm responsibly. Thanks, John. Well, don't go anywhere. A look at some classic iron machinery. Pete, he has Tractor Tales next. Tractor Tales on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Farmall. 100 years of milestones, community, and memories. Since 1923, it's been the one for all. Celebrate with Case IH at farmall100.com. Hey folks, welcome back to Tractor Tales. This week we're in Schulzburg, Wisconsin. And we got a real treat here. We're with Stacy Allendorf. And Stacy, this is a beautiful Farmall M. Can you tell us the story on it? Well, um, this was actually a gift from my husband. Uh, before we met, uh, when I was out of high school, I used to pull antique tractors. Okay. And um, at, he knew that and wasn't a part of it at that point, but he seen this one in town at uh, Shellsburg, and he asked me if it was worth buying. And I said, well, if it's got brakes, it's worth buying. So we checked it out, it had brakes and everything, and he never said anything about it. And I came home from work one day, and he goes, I got a surprise for you. And I go, what's that? And we went out to the shed, and here is this M sitting there. And he goes, you always said you wanted a convertible, didn't you? <laughs> I go, yes, I did. Oh, so this is my tractor, the only red one on the farm. <laughs> and you, you had uh, pulling roots. You had been, what were you, what tractors were you pulling with back in the day? M's and super M's. Super. Yep, antique tractors, yep. Okay, so since you've had it on the farm here, Stacy, uh, do you guys take it to parades or do you? No, we don't take it to any parades. We do use it to rake hay okay. occasionally. Every once in a while it is on an auger, so. Nice. Yep, we do use it. Oh, it's uh, early 50s M that's still earning its keep around here, huh? Sure is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I understand the dealer, uh, Blackborns, out of uh, Shellsburg here, uh, they, uh, they sold it new, you think? The story I got is they sold it new, uh, took it back in on trade, and as far as I understand, we are the second owner of it. And you said this is the only red tractor on the farm? I, I, we do see a lot of green here, but... Uh, only red tractor. So it's holding up the, uh, the red side of the equation pretty well, huh? Yep, sure is. What do you uh, 
foresee for the future for the M on the farm here, Stacy? Just a lot more happy use or? Oh, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's, it'll be here, we'll use it occasionally. I think uh, from that very first uh, great surprise gift, it's found, a, it's found the right home, hasn't it? It has, yep. Well, as we all know, soil type is a crucial part of the yield equation. But what can you do to fix poor soils? Michelle Rook looks at how you can flip your soil next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. As farmers are heading to the fields to plant this spring, we're looking at ways to help achieve higher yields. Michelle Ruck joins us to look at some of the practices they can implement to flip their soil this season. When it comes to improving soil health and making it more productive, there's no quick fix. Building or in some cases rebuilding organic matter doesn't happen overnight. However, even small changes can pay big dividends at harvest. Soils with adequate organic matter generally produce higher yields, but building it is a tough job, even for no-till farmers that were early innovators. So if you've been using tillage for years and you move into a no-till, strip-till environment, you'll see a little bit up, uptrend on the uh, organic matter over time, but then you'll reach a plateau and it'll flatten out. At that point, Brary says even farmers that have implemented all the right tools can't double or triple organic matter. More commonly, they see fractional gains, but even those small changes can make a big difference in soil health. And I think it's a situation where the biology's improved, and when the biology improves, you have more microbes. More microbes eat more carbon. More, more carbon that's ate, the more CO2 is released. Organic matter can be destroyed on a farm with practices like excessive tillage and not protecting the soil from erosion. Prairie says once lost, it can take years to restore it through good stewardship practices, including no-till and cover crops. But there is nothing that we found that overnight we can fix poor soil. And sometimes working with guys, uh, there's a lot of different calibers of soil, right? There's, there could be a sick soil that's 3.5% organic matter but been abused, and there could be a healthy soil that's 1% organic matter that's never been abused, and that sick soil at 3% organic matter is still going to outproduce the 1% because even in a tough state, it's going to be able to hold more water, produce more nutrients in there. And that will result in a yield response. Mm -hmm. Farmers like Brad Dodds have seen that from the comprehensive approach they're taking to improving organic matter on their farm. Soil health, we are minimum tillage. We just run a vertical tillage tool over stalks in the fall and then stale seed bed them in the spring. Going into corn, we try to strip till everything, uh, just fall strips made and we don't do anything else. On our steep ground, we do do cover crops just to try to save any type of soil. On our really light ground, we do do a soybean wheat rotation uh, just to try to make sure the ground's covered all the time and not putting uh, happen to work it for corn or anything. On a nutrition, we uh, grid sample, we fertilize every year, plus we do have hog manure on certain areas, which helps a lot on our fertility. Applying manure can also improve overall soil health as long as it's applied correctly and farmers have it tested for nutrient levels. If that manure has a lot of carbon in it, so it's got bedding in it, bed and pack, stuff like that, you're bringing organic matter to the field and that's food for your microbes. So the answer is yes, if it's applied right at the right rates, uh, it's good for the soil. Some of our lagoon and pit manure is not probably a lot different than commercial fertilizer in that case, meaning that it's, it's N, P, and K and there's not a lot of carbon into it. Um, the biggest issue is that we don't over apply it. Dad says livestock manure has replaced a big chunk of his commercial fertilizer and at the same time, he's seen higher production. Well, yield increase, and then especially the last year, we've had a good yield increase, and then the savings on the fertilizer when the fertilizer markets went parabolic last year, uh, we were still able to have pretty much a flat fee on our fertilizer rates or fertilizer costs. We could plug that in for our balance sheet. Which is so important with record high prices for all inputs. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, cattle prices coming under pressure. Is it a short-term problem or a bigger market correction? That's next. Flip Your Soil on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Economics. 
Economics is the go-to resource to keep your soil and bottom line as healthy as possible. Access one-of-a-kind tools, research, and agronomy content at Nutrien-Economics.com. John Payne, Alan Brigler joining us again. John, before we get into the Fed decision and also looking at bank failures, let's look at cattle. We've seen a, a bit of correction here. Is it truly a short-term correction that we've seen as of late, or is it kind of a, a longer-term issue now? Oh, I don't think a longer term issue is the way I would describe it. I think the market's, you know, pretty well set up in the back end of the feeder curve relative to where the front months are trading. You know, we're essentially record. We got a record price for, you know, Q3, Q4 cattle on the feeders, or at least we did. And then you have the front month, May. And I understand it's a different crop year, but I mean, you're trading $20 under. The April went off $30 under. So, you know, we got to see the cash market stay strong. I think you look at where the economics are. Not so much on the live, but on the beef. And for me, you know, the beef at 300 uh, versus, you know, hog carcass at 80, it, it doesn't make sense that we'll stay here long term. I don't think we're at the, quite the spread levels we saw in 2014, but we're close. And I think at this point, you know, if you're going to have guys wanting to pay 885 for steers in Q2 of next year, then we're going to see beef stay above 300, which means it's going to stay record over over pork for the next two years. So. Something's going to change there in the next six months or so, I think, in either market. Alan, I know you watch that market closely, too. What is your perspective of where we could see these cattle prices go? Well, again, I think that uh, to John's point, the feeders have built in the, the, the cattle cycle turn, OK, or rather the lack of cattle cycle turn. We're still we're still drawing down our herd where we may not actually turn the cattle cycle till 2025. The problem is the board's gotten ahead of the cash uh, by quite a bit here. You you see that in the in the uh, cattle futures. You see that in the in the feeder futures for sure with that with that big premium in the fall. Uh, so whenever you get that, you're you're going to have that tendency to have these five or six dollar pullbacks, just uh, because of uh, funds needing to liquidate or hedges needing to be rolled forward to the next month. Uh, one thing I'd point out is the. Uh, we do have that huge spread on the on the wholesale level between beef and pork, but it's not as obvious on the retail end. Uh, the the uh, uh, retail premium in pork is is actually pretty stiff right now, and uh, they've been trying to feature the beef a little bit more. Uh, the thing I'm really going to watch for here is Memorial Day demand for steak. Uh, that's the grilling season's coming up. Uh, if we see some really good movement there. Then, then we'll assume the consumers are in good shape. And uh, I think hogs will uh, recover here. We've, we've got a normal seasonal slowdown in slaughter here. It's slow to develop, uh, but we're, you can see the summer prices on the futures are expecting, still expecting some kind of an improvement in the, in the cutouts. Alan, when you look at some of that the demand, you mentioned it, that has been impressive. And so, John, now when we look at another rate hike by the Fed, looking at this, this, this bank failure, what do you think we're not talking about on the potential fallout and ripple effect on our ag commodity markets? Well, I think we should be rather excited that the, the ag banks are strong. You know, I think that's where my focus would be. There's opportunities here. I think there's a lot of money that's taken opportunities on some of these banks that have failed over the last two to three weeks. And there are going to be more that, that fail. I don't want to break news here. This is something that's going to happen with the cycle we have. Right now, the U.S. is being focused on this because we have 4,000 something banks, whereas in Canada, I think they have nine. And in Europe, I think they have 119. So essentially what we're having is a normal economic correction in, in an industry where you have players who can't make it. And at this point, we haven't seen that nag yet. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's structurally some things that can change to bring that about. But right now, I feel pretty, pretty good. I think the U.S. producers in a, in a pretty good standpoint from, from, a, from a financial perspective. Uh, it's the actual U.S. consumer. I'm mean, not the consumer, the consumer of these products that I worry about from their credit standpoint. Just the inability to buy ahead for some of these guys might catch up to them down the road. Alan, are you fearful that then this could actually move into some of these ag banks? I, I think the ag banks learned the lessons pretty well in the 1980s uh, and, and have remained conservative ever since. We saw that in the 06, 08 meltdown that the, the ag banks were in pretty good shape compared to uh, some of the ones in California and other places they got in trouble because they, they didn't allow their ratios to get as far out of whack. Uh, we have seen quite a bit 
a buildup in in real estate debt within the ag sector. Uh, the you know, but the the debt to asset ratios overall are still pretty good. If, you know, farmers are not uh, overextended. It's helped to have this uh, very strong farm income over the last two years. Uh, so I'm not not really concerned there about the the ag banks and the ag lending situation. Uh, I I think we what we want to watch is farm income because if if we do mean revert these prices, farm income comes down. Uh, you can't continue to pay the kind of uh, prices you're seeing for farmland here recently. Yeah, a really good point, Alan. Thank you both so much, John Allen, for joining us this weekend. We need to take a quick break, and then we'll be joined by Andrew McRae for American Countryside next. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. Well, not many farms in the U.S. can say their claim to fame is a close encounter with a nuclear bomb, and thankfully so. Andrew McRae uncovers a piece of history at one North Carolina farm in American countryside this weekend. Brent Tyndall's family farmed the ground around their family's homestead for decades, but an event in January of 1961 is still a vivid memory. I will never forget my grandmother saying she thought it was the end of the world because it looked like the world was on fire out here. A B-52 from nearby Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina, had crashed in the field they rented just a few hundred yards from his grandparents' home. A quick response to a plane crash was to be expected, but what was unexpected was what was on board that plane. Supposed to have been two bombs, two hydrogen bombs, I think. Uh, one went down with the plane, my understanding. The other one was in a parachute hanging in a tree back over here about a tenth of a mile or so from here. At the time, the military hadn't disclosed what was on board the B-52 that went down near Faro, North Carolina. We now know the plane was carrying two thermonuclear bombs, which broke free from the plane just before it crashed. One bomb parachuted safely, landing in a nearby tree. The other hit the Tyndall's farm field, traveling about 700 miles per hour. The search was now on, digging for the nuclear material in that weapon. They said there was a hole big enough that they had a road on the inside of it to drive the dump trucks down to bring the water out. And he always told me there was 14 big diesel water pumps that pumped 24 hours a day for a long, for months and months. The details about the incident were sealed for over 50 years. Lieutenant Jack Ravel led a team of men who were searching for the uranium and plutonium core of the bomb, which is buried somewhere deep in the earth and was sinking deeper into the North Carolina mud. Brent later heard the lieutenant share the declassified story of the recovery effort here at the field Brent farmed. But he said, I, I got it. He said, it it's gone. The, the harmful stuff is out of it. That may be true, but Brent says the health department tested water and wells here for many years. It was later revealed that each bomb had four safety switches. On one of the bombs, three of the switches had failed. If the fourth had failed, a detonation 250 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima would have obliterated everything for several miles at this spot. You can actually see almost a bowl effect. You see it? How it goes up and then comes back down and then goes back up into a bowl effect. That's kind of where the hole is. Tyndall didn't own the ground, but rented and farmed it. If you look closely, you can see the clay on top of the soil, showing where the hole was filled. There's an easement over the site, and while it can be farmed, no one is allowed to dig more than a few feet deep on the property. While there is really nothing to see here, decades later, the story still has people driving these rural roads to this field beside Brent's home. And a lot of people come to my house all the time and pull up and say, I hate to bother you. I said, you're here for the bomb, right? Several decades have passed now. The only signs you'll find of that crash are this clay soil and these ruts, an indication of the hole that was dug in an effort to find that hydrogen bomb, a bomb that thankfully never detonated on this farm. Traveling the countryside in Faro, North Carolina, I'm Andrew McRae. Thanks, Andrew. And you can hear more of his travels at AmericanCountryside.com. Well, California finally seen some snowpack, but is there a longer term solution. We check in with John Phipps again next. Why don't we just desalinate ocean water? U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Brandt, technology-driven nutrition that feeds your crop. California has seen some impressive snowpack this year to help supply irrigation needs, but is there a better long-term solution? That's customer support this week. 
Got a good question from John Kubler in Jefferson, Ohio. Do you think the far western states will ever use the vast waters of the Pacific Ocean to help solve their drought problems, or will it always be too expensive? This is one of those problems that when you first look at it, you think there's got to be a way. You got all this water out there, you need it in here. Then you do the math. The steadily worsening water supply problem for cities in places like California and Arizona, particularly those on the coast, keeps the dream of desalination alive. The expense is a gigantic hurdle, but long pipelines and deeper wells are making it seem less so in comparison. There are two basic ways to remove salt from water, boil it or filter it. Flash evaporation pl uh, plants require a heat source, ideally secondary heat from some other operation like a big power plant. Reverse osmosis plants use a sort of chemical-based filtering membrane. Both have the obvious problem of what do you do with the salt and other stuff you remove from the seawater. There is a new and more subtle challenge as well. Sea levels are on track to be a foot higher by 2050 and around four feet higher by 2100, barring any effective emissions reductions before then. Cities with water sources dependent on river flows into the sea will experience advancing seawater intrusions farther upriver than anyone had ever planned for or even imagined a few decades ago. Not only will this drive the need for new or more distant freshwater sources, but also makes siting any desalination plant more complicated. Desalinated water is the most expensive source of fresh water. The costs are like building a thousand mile pipeline or getting over a 6,000 foot mountain range. Still, for areas where large cities are on the edges of both a desert and an ocean, such as the Persian Gulf, the economics become more uh, feasible. Population centers coping with explosive growth, such as New Delhi, India, are also considering desalination. The most recent twist is what happened this winter, though, as weather patterns, such as what happened on the Pacific coast, become more volatile and extreme, the calculations for sourcing water almost defy any kind of prediction. In fact, the second desalination plant planned for Southern California may be slow walked after the atmospheric rivers this winter in California. Bottom line, desalination is a viable but expensive and difficult way to provide water for very specific locations. All right, John talked about the Illinois dust storm earlier, but is there an actual explanation for what happened? That's from the farm next. Well, Illinois isn't the only Midwestern state to see dust storms lately. States like Missouri actually experienced one last weekend, but it didn't make headlines because it didn't cause a massive traffic accident. So what's the explanation for the rare weather event? That's from the farm this weekend. It's a rare sight in Illinois. On Monday, a deadly dust storm caused a massive pileup on a major Illinois interstate. Sounds like due to the, the low visibility, the high winds, everything, it was, everything just came together, unfortunately, in this particular stretch of I-55, and it, it was, my heart goes out to them. More than 70 vehicles crashed on a two-mile stretch of I-55 as extreme winds clocked in at up to 55 miles per hour. You couldn't see, like somebody put a brown blanket in front of your windshield. Couldn't see nothing. The Illinois State Police saying the pileups were caused by, quote, excessive winds blowing dirt from farm fields across the highway, resulting in zero visibility, end quote. It's pretty unusual because oftentimes you don't have the combination of bare soils, high winds, and the cross angle across a highway, a major highway, just to deliver those types of conditions. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says dust storms like this aren't as uncommon in the West. But here, considering 40% of the corn planting is already complete in Illinois, and soybeans have gone in the ground in a record pace, that means it's also a small window where the topsoil is exposed. So the open agricultural fields, we're in this really narrow window between when fields are planted and, you know, between the tilling and the establishment of a crop canopy. 
That's a pretty short period of time. Rippey describes Monday as an unfortunate, perfect storm of conditions that created such a tragic event. Even in perfect conditions, you can get, you know, perfect practices. You can still get a situation where you have a very short window. If topsoils are dry, they can still blow. So it's just, a, I think, a really unfortunate uh, collision of events that happened yesterday between the strong storm, the angle of the wind, the condition of the fields, the dryness over the last month. Maybe no way to really prevent that. And uh, it's just, again, a, a real tragedy. Hopefully it's a, a one-off and we won't see anything else like this this spring. Now, Rippey says where the threat is still high for a dust storm is the plains. Even with the recent rains, Rippey says extreme drought conditions still exist and high winds are still a concern for future dust storms. All right, that does it this weekend on U.S. Farm Report. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to tune in again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. Closed captioning on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by BASF. BASF, helping you to do the biggest job on earth. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.